Book TV, join the NYU professor and contributor to The Nation, Harper's, and The New York Times for a discussion at the Hart Institute in California, the U.S. and Latin America, Sunday at 1.15 a.m. Eastern, here on Book TV. Former President of the United States and Nobel Peace Laureate Jimmy Carter on In-Depth, live from his home in Plains, Georgia, Sunday, December 3rd, beginning at noon Eastern. President Carter is also the author of more than 20 books, such as Our Endangered Values, Keeping Faith, and The Blood of Abraham. His latest, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, is due for release later this month. Join our live three-hour discussion from Plains, Georgia, as Book TV's In-Depth welcomes President Jimmy Carter, Sunday, December 3rd at noon Eastern on C-SPAN 2. Now an author panel on religion, featuring misquoting Jesus author Bart Ehrman, Losing Moses on the Freeway author Chris Hedges, and moderated by New York Times national religion correspondent Laurie Goodstein. This event from the 2006 Great Read in the Park in New York City is around 40 minutes. Sorry for our time it took for us to organize ourselves. We're a big, big family here, a big panel. Uh, my name is Lori Goodstein. I'm a national religion correspondent at the New York Times. And um, I'm glad to uh, welcome you here today. This is a panel on religion. In the Quran, it is written that Muslims, Jews, and Christians are people of the book. And that's about right, judging by the amount of publishing going on in the field of religion. As a reporter on the religion beat, I receive at least five new books or galleys each day. And I've seen a dramatic change over the years, with, of course, 9-11 as the dividing line. Before 9-11, I got a lot of self-help titles, books on angels, on charting your chakras, what I'd call self-centered religion. Since then, a lot of religion books are more likely to grapple with global weighty issues and questions like, can Islam, Christianity, and Judaism coexist? Or will World War III start next year in Jerusalem? Are there other gospels that were left out of the Bible? And if so, why? Do the Ten Commandments have any bearing on how people actually live their lives? Today we're going to hear from the authors of four titles that have risen to the top of the stacks. They represent the breadth and diversity of offerings in the religion field today. I'll introduce each book and its authors uh, before they speak to you. We're going to do this in three segments. And they're going to be very brief because I know you're going to have a lot of questions. So we're going to start with the authors of the Faith Club. Suzanne Oliver, Rania Idlibi, and Priscilla Warner. They're collaborators on the book, The Faith Club, which is what you would get if you took the TV show, The View, and had Rosie O'Donnell and Barbara Walters talk only about religion. After 9-11, these three idealists set out to write a feel-good children's book about the similarities of their faiths, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. But they soon realized that before they could affirm their similarities, they had to confront their differences. Their arguments about the crucifixion, about God, the Holocaust, Israel, and Palestine, they're all in the book, No Holds Barred. Suzanne Oliver, the Christian member of the group, grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, where she made her first communion at St. Elizabeth's <laughs> Catholic Church. She majored in English literature and German at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. She's worked at Financial World Magazine, at Forbes as a senior editor, and SmartMoney.com, where she was managing editor. Rania Idlibi is a Muslim American whose family was uprooted from Tiberias, a Palestinian town by the Sea of Galilee, during the creation of Israel. She grew up with a foot in the east, in Dubai, and a foot in the west, in McLean, Virginia. She graduated from Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service and has a master's degree from the London School of Economics. Love and marriage brought her to New York City, where she lives with her husband and two children. Priscilla Warner, the Faith Club's Jewish member, grew up in Rhode Island, where she received something of an interfaith education by attending a Hebrew day school and moving on to a Quaker high school. She graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a degree in fine arts and spent 15 years in, as an advertising art director at various ad agencies in Boston and New York. 
Inspired by her two sons, she began writing and illustrating children's books. She lives with her family in Westchester County, New York. So I introduce you to the members of the Faith Club. Thank you for being here. Um, as you know by now, I am the Muslim mother. I came to the Faith Club out of a deep sense of isolation and alienation from the public dominant voice of Islam after 9-11. As a mother, I was deeply concerned and worried about what it would mean for my American-born children to grow up both American and Muslim. I knew I needed them to be proud. With that challenge in mind, I sort of hit the books and start reading. Um, and it doesn't take me long to discover what I feel is the true inner beauty of Islam. The fact that Muslims kneel down in prayer five times a day and end their prayers with salutations of peace to Abraham and, this, and his descendants, including Moses and Jesus and the Prophet Muhammad, the fact that Muslims believe in the Gospels and the Torah, the fact that Muslims believe that essentially Judaism, Christianity, Islam are but three forms of one religion at the root, the religion of Abraham. With that in mind, um, I'm excited and inspired to reach out to a Christian mother and a Jewish mother to try and do something to uh, write uh, a children's book that would uh, serve to highlight the commonalities of our, our faith tradition. No sooner had we started talking, though, that of course the, uh, the Jewish and the Christian mother started having their own uh, conflict, which I'll let them talk about. But um, I'll, ha I'll leave you with this thought. As they were hashing it uh, uh, between the two of them, I kept thinking, they kept talking about the salient points in the judo-christian tradition and i kept thinking why isn't it the judo-christian muslim tradition so um when they finally get to me and, and the dialogue the dialogue centers on two stereotypes the first one is of course the idea that priscilla came home soon from a cocktail party and she said you know you say your god is our god too but I don't know, a very erudite man said to me, there are Me Mecca versus Medina versus and so on and so forth. The idea that within Islam, within its text, at, um, the text hold, holds the root to, to conflict, to uh, a religion of the sword spread by the sword. I'm here to tell you that nowhere in the Quran does it say kill and you shall be rewarded. And that when religion is used to justify violence or as a tactic of war, it is no longer a religion but a human ideology and has nothing to do with God's values. Um, the second stereotype is the idea of Islam being um, repressive and anti-women. And I'm here also again to counter that image to tell you that 1.6 billion Muslims um, in the world choose to stay within the faith tradition of Islam, not because it's a, it came to suppress and discriminate against, uh, against women, but rather the Prophet is revered as someone who came to advocate as a champion of women's rights. Um, Two personal things had to happen. I came to the, to the faith club, uh, someone describing herself of faith but no religion. And through our dialogue, I had an affirmation. I come out a more confident and affirmed Muslim. Uh, the two big challenges for me was I needed my faith tradition, my religion, to sustain my belief in a universal God. The good news is it does. There are many verses within the Quran that confirms the idea that had God willed, he would have made us all the same tribe, creed, or religion, but it was by God's intended design that he would have us of different religions because he wanted us to know one another and through our actions prove ourselves. Uh, the second issue is the idea that I would have to dress a certain way, wear a veil perhaps, or live a certain way, eat a certain way, drink a certain way in order to qualify as a Muslim. I was helped with that challenge um, through eventually my finding an imam who's wonderful and he was able to refine for me the difference between re religion and faith when he shared with me an anecdote about the Prophet Muhammad when he was asked what does it take to be a good Muslim? Well the first thing is a belief in God, the second the prophecies, the third is to act as if God was with you. Once you have fulfilled these three requirements you have faith and then and only then should you choose to you can use your rituals of your faith tradition to service your faith. So the Faith Up is basically a dialogue of the common person. Uh, it's a call for us to have this dialogue. We're here, we're honored to be amongst these wonderful scholars, theologians, and people who are so accomplished. We are mothers who set out to have a dialogue with um, our children in mind, and we found it so liberating. And our call is that um, for you to go ahead and do the same. And for, for me personally, as a, an, a fellow American citizen, to ask you to ask me the tough questions. Please uh, don't live under the misconceptions and assumptions. Don't out me as the other. 
And uh, for Muslims, it's a call to, to read the Quran, to make it as part of the fabric of your life. Because as Muslims, I feel like we can celebrate the universal um, God accessible to all. We have access to the Christian God, the God of passion and love, the Jewish God, the mitzvahs and actions. And third, the, the Muslim God, uh, God accessible to all. I'm very excited because I feel that in the very near, I know I'm going to, I have, I've been asked to, to summarize 60 minute presentation in three. I'm, getting down to my punchline. <laughs> so um, this is it. I'm looking, I, I look at my daughter, and my son's not here, but my daughter's here, and I'm, I'm very um, confident and secure that I know that in the near future, they'll be able to speak of the, and proudly speak of the great American Judeo-Christian Muslim tradition. I'm a Jewish mother. Um, I came to this, my crisis of faith was purely about fear. After September 11th, I was basically paralyzed, terrified of terrorism. I ironically had gone to a Hebrew day school. I was very well grounded in my religion, but I say I had religion but no faith. I answered a phone call from Suzanne Oliver. It seemed the whole world was screaming about religion, and I thought, well, if I meet these two women, and I sit down and we talk calmly about religion, maybe something will come of it. Little did I know we would not be talking so calmly and quietly. People say we took off the gloves. People say we said things nobody says to each other. We built up a level of trust over a number of years. And I do think that it's a conversation that many, many people can replicate. But the most important thing that I learned was the first tenet of the Faith Club was honesty. Um, that everyone wants to be validated for who they are. A very important lesson for me, I came into it with some stereotypes. When I walked into Rania's apartment, I had never met a Muslim woman before. I'd certainly never met a Palestinian woman before. And later I wrote that I expected, I was shocked that Ronnie would sit down and talk to me face to face so honestly, welcome me so graciously into her home. Um, I grew up, you know, with this notion that Jews were going to be pushed into the ocean and instead she fed me, fed me beautifully and fed me body, mind, soul, uh, all across the board. I had some stereotypes about Christians, oddly enough, even though I went to a Quaker school and had as I say, some of my best friends were Christians, but I met a woman. A lot of the, the um, I think, the strength of this book is that we were all strangers to each other. Ronnie and Suzanne met at a bus stop. Suzanne made a phone call and got hooked up with me. So I met a woman who went to all Catholic schools, grew up in the Midwest, Texas Christian University, who loved Jesus and spoke about Jesus very openly. And Jesus was kind of a stranger to me. I talk a lot in the book about how Jesus is a stranger to the Jews. Um, and when we got into our discussion about the crucifixion, you have to read the book because I've only got three minutes and that's a good way to plug the book, but we got into a very animated discussion about Jesus. And after Suzanne, over the course of many, many months, read to me from the Sermon on the Mount and some of my very favorite quotes in the book come from Jesus, I'm proud to say that I'm now on a first name basis with Jesus. I talk about Jesus to my children and I write in the chapter after, you can imagine the, the conversations we had after the conversations that divided us, we had amazing conversations about what united us. As Rania says, we all begin the same way and we will all end the same way. We have all lost loved ones. We've all suffered pain. One of the important things I learned in the book through my conversations with Rania and Suzanne was not to quantify suffering, not to compare my suffering to anyone else's. It doesn't really serve to move people forward. Everyone has pain, everyone suffers. But after the painful chapters came my favorite chapters. Um, and I, in the end of the book, started off as a person without a definition of God. By the end of the book, after flying over the Great Lakes and looking down below me and recognizing my humility, which is, Suzanne Rania pointed out to me, Islam means to submit and that means to acknowledge your, your humility in the universe. Um, I shrunk myself down and paradoxically I found enormous power in that. And my definition of God is the one now that begins my book and it's Martin Buber's definition. Um, when two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. And I say that when we're together, sparks fly and the current is very strong. I might tell you a little more about what some of those sparks were. <laughs> um, I am obviously the Christian. I came to the Faith Club Project after 9-11 when, like many New Yorkers and many Americans, I was interested in learning more about the Middle East and Islam in order to assess how safe my family and I were in New York and what was going on. So I met Rania at the school bus stop. Our daughters started kindergarten together that year. And when she started telling me the story she had come across about the connections among Judaism, Islam, and Christianity and told me her idea of writing a children's book, 
I jumped at the opportunity to spread a message of peace among three religions whose differences were really fueling violence and misunderstanding and hatred. Um, in fact, she'd already invited another Christian, and I grabbed the phone and told her to cancel that other Christian right away because I wanted to join this project. <laughs> Guess if I was going to summarize my faith club journey very quickly, I would talk about it as one of being from a certain amount of certainty to doubt. As I started the faith club, I was very interested in learning more about Islam and Judaism. I thought of Islam as a violent religion controlled by men and filled with mistreated women, yet here was Rania who wasn't covered, who didn't seem to be mistreated by her husband whom I met, and who drank a glass of wine on occasion. I wanted to know how she reconciled what her modern life with what I thought of as the religion of Islam. And my knowledge of Judaism, though we share the Old Testament, was not that uh, much more substantial. I thought of it as an ancient and exclusive religion and one that didn't benefit from Jesus' message of love and life everlasting. So while I was interested in learning more, it was in a more of an academic sort of way. I didn't think that what I learned was going to sway any inner conviction or suspicion that I had that Christianity was the superior religion of these three. But then as soon as we started talking, everything that I thought um, came into question. And I started to question language that I'd been using for 40 years, now you know how old I am, and not really... <laughs> not really thinking about what that language meant. Early on, as Rania was talking about her temple and church envy, because she doesn't have a mosque in New York where she feels very comfortable, I brought her to my Episcopal church and thought maybe it could be a sort of a spiritual foster home for her, a place where she could join in our charitable projects, and we had all celebrated this one God that we believed in. So her family came with us to Easter service, and the music and the flowers, it was all wonderful, and then all of a sudden we started talking about Lamb of God and body and blood and the sacrificial lamb and I started feeling really self-conscious and wondered what does this all mean that I've been saying all the time and realizing that this was actually something that separated us. So then there were other things that were coming to the forefront right away. As Ronnie started talking about uh, Muhammad's mission on earth, I felt Jesus' position threatened by a follow-up prophet and thought, well, hadn't God played his trump card with Jesus? Why would he need to send somebody else? And as I was talking about the crucifixion with um, Priscilla, and she heard words differently than I had meant for them to be heard and thought that I was accusing Jews of being Christ killers. Um, she asked me at one point as I was writing about uh, Pentecost if I could just leave the crucifixion out of the story. <laughs> so <laughs> it shows you how far we've come that we're able to laugh about things like that now. Um, I suppose as we talked about... Uh, as, Priscilla was talking to me about uh, Reformed Judaism's idea of a God existing without an afterlife. That really made me question my own idea of God because God and an afterlife had always come hand in hand as we came to talk about Jesus as a symbol of love and suffering. And um, I started questioning whether he was divine. Did I have to believe he was divine as he was a Christian? As I started reading books like Misquoting Jesus, I um, started, <laughs> all these questions came forward. I was very lucky to have access to a fantastic priest at my parish who reassured me right away with the words, the opposite of faith is not doubt, it's certainty. And from that point on, I was really able to embrace my doubt. It kept me humble, it allowed me to open my mind. I was able to see how Priscilla and Rania both found um, elements in their own tradition that fed their spirituality, that brought them closer to God. And um, I quickly will sum it up. Then I brought um, Priscilla and Rania with me to St. James, my church, and we were talking to the teenagers about our own journeys as we were having our conversations together. And I think um, one of them uh, asked us, well, in order to believe in your own religion, don't you have to believe that the other two are wrong? And I think this was the nugget of what I was wrestling with through a lot of the faith club. And I told him that no, I didn't think so, that I didn't think God differentiated between a good Muslim, a good Jew, a good Christian, a good atheist, and that if God didn't differentiate, then why should I? Um, and I was able to find um, certainly lots of uh, quotes within the Bible that I felt um, supported that. And as we have gotten emails critical of uh, the sort of universalistic view that I've come to, even the, the scripture that they put forward, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to God is through me, is one that I see as being so open. Because to me that says the only way is by... Um, following Jesus' message of love and compassion for your fellow man, and that, I know, is common to all three of our religions. Thank you, and thank you for um, keeping it tight. We have 
I want to I want to give you enough time to get to know these writers, but also to have a little bit of time at the end to ask questions. So, our next our next speakers are both going to speak on a, a similar topic. Um, earlier this year, the National Geographic Society upset a whole lot of people with the announcement of a new archaeological discovery, the Gospel of Judas. It turned the Bible's version of Judas on its head. And among the experts whom the National Geographic Society called on to help interpret the text for the public were these two writers. I'll start with Bart Ehrman, who's at the end there. He is the author of The Lost Gospel. He is a distinguished professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He chairs the Department of Religious Studies there, and his specialty is the New Testament and the history of early Christianity. Now, Bart has his own interesting personal history of Christianity, I'd say. In his youth, he was a conservative evangelical, and he attended Wheaton College in Illinois. Later at Princeton Seminary, he began to question whether the Bible is the literal, inerrant word of God. His own search for answers is reflected in his scholarly books. He's written and edited 19 books, and among his most recent are Lost Scriptures, books that did not make it into the New Testament, and Misquoting Jesus, the story behind who changed the Bible and why. I'll also introduce Herbert Krosny. He's the author of also The Lost Gospel, The Quest for the Gospel of Judas Iscariot. He's a writer and documentary filmmaker. He specializes in investigative and historical projects and has worked for the BBC, PBS, the History Channel, and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. He's a graduate of Harvard. He reported for the Albany Times Union newspaper and then served in the U.S. Army. And then he moved into television, working for CBS, ABC, and the predecessor of PBS, National Educational Television. I don't know how many people remember that. Um, in 1968, he went to Israel to head the documentary department of Israel Television. And in 1970, he formed his own documentary company. He's produced pieces on Jerusalem, World War II, Russia, and Iran's nuclear ambitions. Uh, in addition to the Lost Gospel, Krosny has written several other books, including Beyond Welfare, Poverty in the Super City, and Deadly Business, Legal Deals, and Outlaw Weapons. So I give you Bart Ehrman and Herb Krosny. Thank you. In some sense, Christianity has always uh, been in a state of crisis because uh, Christianity from the very foundations uh, of the faith has insisted that Christ, in some sense, is the way of salvation and yet Christians haven't been able to agree on what that way entails. Uh, the uh, Gospel of Judas that's just been discovered and uh, published just six years ago, six months ago now, uh, by National Geographic is a good illustration of how diverse early Christianity was. Uh, Christianity today continues to be extremely diverse. Uh, if you compare what a, a Greek Orthodox priest thinks with what an Appalachian snake handler thinks, uh, or an Episcopalian with a Mormon, or a Jehovah's Witness with a Seventh-day Adventist, you have an enormous range of beliefs and practices among Christians today. In, in the ancient world, the beliefs and practices were even more diverse. Uh, my, my expertise in Christianity is in the first, second, and third centuries. In the second and third centuries, there were Christians who uh, obviously believed that there was one God. There were other Christians who believed that there were two gods. And some said there were 12 gods. We know of some Christians who said there were 36 gods. We have one Christian group that said there were 365 gods, which is very convenient, because then you could have a god a day. <laughs> you are god for today. Um, Christians believe, some Christians believe Jesus was both human and divine. Some said he was human but not divine. Some said he was divine but not human. Uh, Christ, some Christians said God created this world. Others said God never had anything to do with this world. Different Christians had different points of view, and they all claimed that their points of view represented the views of Jesus himself as, as found in the writings of his apostles. All of these various groups had books that claimed to be written by apostles that represented each of these mutually exclusive points of view. The Gospel of Judas is one of these books that now has been discovered that, ha that illustrates quite well the diversity of early Christianity. The Gospel of Judas is a product of early Christian Gnosticism. 
Gnosticism is a, is a term that scholars use for a range of religions that uh, understood that the way of salvation is not by faith in Christ's death and resurrection, but by the secret knowledge that Jesus conveyed. Gnostics understood that they were uh, alienated from this world because they didn't really belong here. This material world wasn't created by the one true God. This material world is a cosmic mistake created by lower divinities, and the key to salvation is to escape the material trappings of this world. Uh, the Gnostics were people who felt completely alienated in this existence. They felt like they don't really belong here. This world doesn't make sense to them. I felt this way since the last election. <laughs> the world, the world just uh, uh, makes sense to other people. Well, they belong here, but some of us don't. Well, how do we get out of here? Well, we need to get the knowledge necessary for salvation and escape this world. The Gospel of Judas conveys this secret knowledge. It's a complicated book in some ways because the knowledge that it gives, the revelation that it conveys, is secretive and mystical and hard to understand. But those who are on the inside, the Gnostics are the ones who can understand what this truth is. This, this gospel was condemned as a heresy in the second century and was eliminated from consideration from the canon of the New Testament. Luckily, though, a copy of it was made in, uh, in Egypt in the early 4th century or the late 3rd century. It got buried in a tomb, and luckily it turned up in 1978. The, uh, the story of how it was discovered uh, and, uh, and how it was handled by antiquities dealers until finally we got a translation of it six months ago is uh, summarized for me in my book on Judas, but really uh, the, the entire story is told at great length in Herb Crosney's book on the Lost Gospel. Well, working with Bart was a pleasure because, in addition to anything else, he wrote the introduction to my book, and I, uh, and and he was a great, great uh, scholar of early Christianity. We really didn't know much about the second or third century. Almost everything that we know about the second and third century, which is the formative periods uh, when the church developed, uh, uh, come from the people who were representing the church, particularly Eusebius who lived in Caesarea in what is modern-day Israel. Uh, the, one of the things that has fascinated me in terms of the early history of the, of, uh, the Gospel of Judas is, uh, and, and impressed me was the closeness uh, in the first, second, and third centuries of Judaism and Christianity and how the Gentile peoples, in, in, in essence, adopting the Old Testament were really adopting a history which was foreign to them and uh, which had to be sold to them in many ways and a lot of this was represented and, and, and brought to fruition in the city of Alexandria which three centuries before in the third century when it was founded by Alexander the Great actually gave a charter to the Jews saying you will be treated equal to the Macedonians and it's a little known history but actually Alexander is a revered figure uh, in uh, Jewish history. Uh, and Gnosticism, in many ways, uh, there were two severe repressions of uh, Jews in Alexandria, and Gnosticism is believed partly to have developed out of that. And a lot of what you see in the Gospel of Judas is a reaction, a criticism of uh, uh, the, well, there was the fall of the temple, or there, uh, there is a reaction against. Uh, the God of the Old Testament. Uh, in other words, there was good news for the Jews in, in the Gospel of Judas and freeing up who the Jews were and the responsibility for the uh, crucifixion of Christ. But also, there was a severe rejection of uh, the God of the Old Testament. And, and in fact, the Gospel of Judas is a po highly polytheistic uh, document. Nonetheless, as we come into the present day, uh, we've had an extremely interesting reaction the Vatican, people, there's been some journalists who have written that the Vatican has been extremely critical of us, of, of the Gospel of Judas. In fact, the, the Vatican has not commented in any official way in, in, uh, over the last 15 centuries or so on what is believed to be apocryphal literature. But I found myself on a number of television programs 
uh, uh, not arguing with Catholic priests, but finding the, that certain Catholic priests were, were reestablishing the early Christian wars that Bart writes so ably about and fighting against the Gnosticism, which they thought that they had defeated as a dissident movement within Christianity between the second and fifth centuries. The, the negative reaction, uh, the re we've had extremely a great interest in, in the entire project among all the Catholic and Orthodox countries, meaning Russian Orthodox and Greek Orthodox. Uh, uh, we um, have had certain letter writing campaigns by certain evangelicals against the Gospel of Judas as if we were responsible somehow for this historical document which came out of the desert. Uh, what, it, what I think um, uh, I've brought away from it is the, the, the sense of reverence uh, that many people have, the need, the need for a defining uh, deity and the closeness, nonetheless, with all, with all these conflicts, nonetheless, the closeness among men of wanting to find uh, answers to their condition. Thank you, Herb. Chris Hedges is the author of Losing Moses on the Freeway. The book is an indictment of how far Americans have fallen from following the Ten Commandments. The book's ten chapters reconsider the commandments through Chris's reflections and vignettes of people's lives, very inventive vignettes. Chris's best-selling first book is War is a Force that Gives Us Meaning. It was drawn from his experiences reporting on wars in Central America, in Africa, in Yugoslavia. It was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. He's also written what every person should know about war. Chris grew up the son of a circuit-riding minister in a small town in upstate New York. He and his father talked Bible and morality every Sunday while driving to churches where his father was to preach. He graduated from Colgate University and then Harvard Divinity School, but he eventually decided not to follow his father into ministry. Instead, he pursued a higher calling, journalism. <laughs> He worked for the Dallas Morning News, the Christian Science Monitor, and National Public Radio. He joined the New York Times in 1990 and was a member of the team that won the 2002 Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting for coverage of global terrorism. He lives in Princeton, New Jersey and has a new book coming out in January. Not at all controversial. The title is American Fascism, The Rise of the Christian Right. <laughs> Chris Hedges. Uh, thanks. I. Uh I just wanted to comment briefly, I mean, as somebody who, who did grow up uh, in the church and then spent almost 20 years abroad, seven of those years in the Middle East, uh, in Israel and the Muslim world. Uh, you know, H. Richard Niebuhr, the theologian, had a great line that, you know, religion is a good thing for good people and a bad thing for bad people. Um, there are passages, for instance, in the Gospel of John that are virulently anti-Semitic uh, in the letters of Paul. Uh, you know, denouncing homosexuality. Uh, you know, there are moments in the Hebrew Bible when God can be a bigoted, cruel uh, tyrant that seems to bless acts of genocide if one looks, uh, for instance, when Moses leaves Egypt. Um, and, and I think that, and, and of course, the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel, which are used extensively by the religious writer in our own country to justify and yearn, I think many ways, feed a yearning for apocalyptic violence. Uh, and these passages have to be dealt with because they are within the canon. Uh, the Quran also has very virulent passage, uh, not in the early part, but in the later part against Jews. Uh, and how do we deal with these? Um, I think in, in some ways uh, we have to accept that uh, those darker elements and those people that perhaps H. Richard Niebuhr would define as bad people can find scriptural uh, sanctification for their hatred and bigotry. Uh, and I think sometimes we who, who reach out and, and embrace a, a more a whole or uh, humanistic approach uh, can ignore uh, those passages in the Bible just as assiduously as I think the Christian right will ignore uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, how do we cope with that? How do we deal with that? Um, I, I think as, and we're entering an age where um, the uh, there are powerful forces, fundamentalist forces, not uh, both the uh, Jewish, uh, 
uh, Islamic and Christian, uh, and of course even Hindu, uh, that get scriptural sanctification for bloodlust violence, uh, there has to begin, a, 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 I think, a more concerted response on those of us who uh, uh, believe in, in, in the religious tradition, but I think embrace the values of the Enlightenment and a kind of humanism to denounce these passages within our own uh, scripture, uh, to denounce uh, the book of Revelation, for instance. Uh, I, I, I think too often uh, we, we skirt that issue by pretending that it's not there. And I think we're reaching a point, even within American society, um, where we, we have to confront uh, the fact that, um, you know, even in, the, in a uni Unitarian Universalist Church pew in Boston, uh, there are, uh, within the canon, uh, passages that, uh, uh, that fuel movements that I think are not only anti-religious, but anti-human. Thank you. Our panelists, out of respect for you, really, and respect for each other, have really been very disciplined in their presentations, and that's to give you time to ask questions. So uh, I open it up to questions from the audience. Yes? Yeah, I'm just curious about the degree of confidence uh, in our understanding of what is it that causes religious violence. Of course, we know uh, it's cliche that it's caused by perversion of religion. But I'm afraid that it's far from being that simple. So how, you know, what sort of percentage, 10%, 50%, 90% that we understand what actually is going on that's causing all this violence? Okay, uh, should I repeat the question? Yes, okay. Okay, he is asking, and I'm not sure which panelist you're asking, maybe you throw it open to the whole panel? Okay. Uh, if we really understand what are the causes of religious violence, is that... Well, let, let me just begin as somebody who's covered so-called religious wars in the Middle East or in Yugoslavia, uh, which I think fundamentally are not religious wars. They are, they are wars born out of collapsed societies and despair. Um, and, and I really agree with Freud that uh, people will find uh, ideological structures, uh, whether they're religious. Uh, you know, I, I think one could look generically at communism or fascism uh, as, in generic terms, a kind of religion. Um, it, it, I think they share in common many elements, including that yearnal, yearning for apocalyptic violence, that belief that violence can cleanse the world, purge the world, make the world a better place. Uh, and then, of course, in this weird kind of spiritual Darwinism, uh, all the believers will be lifted up, their clothes left behind with the rest of us who will rot and burn. And, and so I think that, 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 and I think Freud wrote about this very well, I think that what we're dealing with is is those dark currents that what Freud would call the love of Thanatos or the death instinct, um, which is really what these so-called religious systems are about. It's about a yearning for death. I think it's something within human nature, and I think it's wrong if, if, if there wasn't, you know, uh, canonical passages in, uh, you know, in the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel to justify it, they would find something else. I, I, I think it's false to blame religion. Anybody else want to respond to that? That's a, it's a very good, good question. Somebody? Hey, Rania? I think, um, very well put. Again, I, I don't believe the source is uh, religion, and I feel that um, I should probably say something because Islam suffers from that. It's a stereotype that somehow within its texts it's um, more prone to this type of uh, violent reaction. I think that, yes, uh, we are seeing a manifestation of this, whether, uh, but it's a minority, and I think it's more a, a problem of the condition of the state, um, channels of opposition. We have it, Islam is, is a religion in, in countries, for the most part, that we do not have of um, opposition uh, confirmed uh, pa pathways and, 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 and education and, and civic society and, and I think that's really where the root of the problem is rather than looking at it. I mean, few people would think that one should just look at the Bible to really understand the Inquisition or the Crusades and sometimes in our readings here of how do we understand this violent reaction we tend to so be so uh, tunnel visioned and just to look at the Quran, which I don't think is is the one problem. Yes, back here. Isn't the United States somewhat uh, guilty of that? After all, our push west in the 1840s and 1850s under Pope was under the age of manifest destiny and gave us the justification to do whatever we want in the interest 
context of doing God's will. Uh, essentially, uh, we victimized the Native Americans. Essentially, we used that as a justification for opening up the frontier in Mexico. Okay, is there a question? A comment. A comment. Uh, okay, he's asking for a comment on his comment, which is, uh, isn't the United States guilty of something similar with uh, using manifest destiny? Um, in, okay, good. Anybody want to respond to that? Yes. Bart, okay. <laughs> yes? It's, it's very easy to, to um, kill another or to, uh, to justify violence, eradication of a people, so on and so forth, when you make them other. You demonize a whole entire people, culture, population. That's where what we have to watch for. about the separation of church and state. He's saying in the Bible there is a passage that can be understood as uh, uh, the foundation for the separation of church and state, and is there anything in Islam which, which does that? And he's asking that of Rania. Um, very much believe in separation of church and state. I think that there's nothing inherently within Islam that would um, require otherwise. Indonesia is the biggest Muslim state, and it is a secular state. Um, uh, what else can I say? I do not believe that, you know, this, most um, studies that I've, I, as a student, um, was very much under the impression that somehow Islam was an exception, it was different. But, you know, I, from a common person point of view, or, uh, I sort of feel like, well, Judaism has a lot to say about how you carry your personal life too, how you consummate a marriage or you maintain a kitchen. The Catholic Church has a lot to say about um, birth control, so I feel that these are all issues that can pretty much be handled. <laughs> Nothing that's particularly Muslim that would otherwise re re um, prevent us from separating church and state. Do you want, Chris, do you want to speak to that? No, I'm sorry. Well, there's the concept of Sharia in Islam, and it is uh, a belief, uh, at least among certain uh, Muslims or uh, the small radical wing, if you want to call it small, uh, that does believe in a unify and imposition of Islamic law over entire societies, and they are fighting for that. And uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not even being judgmental, but it's just an absolute fact that the, that uh, that is one of the tenets of certain elements within Islam. Well, you know, John Calvin believed the same thing. I mean, you can find it in, you know, Christianity as well. So Islam's hardly exclusive at that point. Yeah, in fact, I mean, Christianity uh, historically has not advocated the separation of church and state. Uh, the, uh, I mean, as soon as the Roman emperor converted to Christianity, nobody wanted there to be a separation of church and state. So it's really, it's a post-enlightenment phenomenon, uh, th this whole idea that has nothing to do really with, with, uh, with having any religious Im Im impetus. Okay, one last question. Yes. A lot of religions are like always saying that they're for like peace and they don't want like violence. And how come there's so much racism and like no, everyone's always fighting about religion? Okay. All right. A good question, a good way to wrap up our panel. Um, he's saying so many religions preach about peace. So why is there so much racism and why is there so much violence? Within religion or within? I think in the world, this is what you're asking, right? Why is the world the way it is? Please, please people tell us need right to now. start. <laughs> people need to start talking. When you talk about peace and religion, Rania, uh, Suzanne and Rania came with me to a Yom Kippur service at my synagogue. Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the year for Jews, the Day of Atonement. And when we fast and we pray for another year of life and to be forgiven for our sins, and when we sat shoulder to shoulder in that synagogue, 